Psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud (1856–1939) was one of the most influential modern scientists to put forth a theory about how people develop a sense of self. He divided the maturation process into stages, and posited that people's self-development is closely linked to their early stages of development. According to Freud, failure to properly engage in or disengage from a specific stage results in emotional and psychological consequences throughout adulthood. Psychologist Eric Erikson, 1902 to 1994, created a theory of personality development based, in part, on the work of Freud. However, Erikson believed the personality continued to change over time and was never truly finished. His theory includes eight stages of development, beginning with birth and ending with death. According to Erikson, people move through these stages throughout their lives. In contrast to Freud's focus on psychosexual stages and basic human urges, Erikson's view of self-development gave credit to more social aspects, like the way we negotiate between our own base desires and what is socially accepted. Erikson 1982. Jean Piaget, 1896 to 1980, was a psychologist who focused on the role of social interactions in child development. He recognized that the development of self evolved through a negotiation between the world as it exists in one's mind and the world that exists as it is experienced socially. Piaget 1954. All three of these thinkers have contributed to our modern understanding of self-development. Psychologist Harry Harlow, 1905-1981, is known for studying the role of social relationships in human development by observing the impact of isolation and maternal deprivation on the development of young rhesus monkeys. Harlow found that the monkeys, when subjected to isolation, exhibit disturbed behaviors, including self-harm, and had a difficult time integrating when reconnected with other monkeys. Harlow also introduced isolated monkeys to simulated surrogate mothers, some that were covered in cloth while others were constructed out of wire. Based on observed behaviors, the young monkeys appeared to develop attachment with the cloth mothers and lean on them for emotional support. More than seven decades later, this experiment continues to inform the research of psychologists, sociologists, and those interested in human development. Sociological Research Sociology or Psychology, what's the difference? You might be wondering, if sociologists and psychologists are both interested in people and their behavior, how are these two disciplines different? What do they agree on, and where do their ideas diverge? The answers are complicated, but the distinction is important to scholars in both fields. As a general difference, we might say that while both disciplines are interested in human behavior, psychologists are focused on how the mind influences that behavior while sociologists study the role of society in shaping behavior. Psychologists are interested in people's mental development and how their minds process their world. Sociologists are more likely to focus on how different aspects of society contribute to an individual's relationship with his world. Another way to think of the difference is that psychologists tend to look inward, mental health, emotional processes, while sociologists tend to look outward, social institutions, cultural norms, interactions with others, to understand human behavior. Emile Durkheim, 1858-1917, was the first to make this distinction in research, when he attributed differences in suicide rates among people to social causes, religious differences, rather than to psychological causes, like their mental well-being, Durkheim 1897. Today, we see this same distinction. For example, a sociologist studying how a couple gets to the point of their first kiss on a date might focus her research on cultural norms for dating, social patterns of sexual activity over time, or how this process is different for seniors than for teens. A psychologist would more likely be interested in the person's earliest sexual awareness or the mental processing of sexual desire. Sometimes sociologists and psychologists have collaborated to increase knowledge. In recent decades, however, their fields have become more clearly separated as sociologists increasingly focus on large societal issues and patterns, while psychologists remain honed in on the human mind. Both disciplines make valuable contributions through different approaches that provide us with different types of useful insights. Sociological Theories of Self-Development One of the pioneering contributors to sociological perspectives was Charles Cooley, 1864-1929. 
He asserted that people's self-understanding is constructed, in part, by their perception of how others view them, a process termed, the looking glass self, Cooley 1902. Later, George Herbert Mead, 1863 to 1931, studied the self, a person's distinct identity that is developed through social interaction. In order to engage in this process of self, an individual has to be able to view him or herself through the eyes of others. That's not an ability that we are born with, Mead 1934. Through socialization we learn to put ourselves in someone else's shoes and look at the world through their perspective. This assists us in becoming self-aware, as we look at ourselves from the perspective of the other. How do we go from being newborns to being humans with selves? Mead believed that there is a specific path of development that all people go through. During the preparatory stage, children are only capable of imitation. They have no ability to imagine how others see things. They copy the actions of people with whom they regularly interact, such as their caregivers. This is followed by the play stage, during which children begin to take on the role that one other person might have. Thus, children might try on a parent's point of view by acting out grown-up behavior like playing dress up and acting out the mom role or talking on a toy telephone the way they see adults do during the game stage children learn to consider several roles at the same time and how those roles interact with each other they learn to understand interactions involving different people with a variety of purposes for example a child at this stage is likely to be aware of the different responsibilities of people in a restaurant who together make for a smooth dining experience someone seats you another takes your order, someone else cooks the food, while yet another clears away dirty dishes. Finally, children develop, understand, and learn the idea of the generalized other, the common behavioral expectations of general society. By this stage of development, an individual is able to imagine how he or she is viewed by one or many others, and thus, from a sociological perspective, to have a self. Mead 1934. Mead 1964. Kohlberg's Theory of Moral Development Moral development is an important part of the socialization process. The term refers to the way people learn what society considers to be good and bad, which is important for a smoothly functioning society. Moral development prevents people from acting on unchecked urges, instead considering what is right for society and good for others. Lawrence Kohlberg 1927 to 1987 was interested in how people learn to decide what is right and what is wrong to understand this topic he developed a theory of moral development that includes three levels pre-conventional conventional and post-conventional in the pre-conventional stage young children who lack a higher level of cognitive ability experience the world around them only through their senses it isn't until the teen years that the conventional theory develops, when youngsters become increasingly aware of others' feelings and take those into consideration when determining what's good and bad. The final stage, called post-conventional, is when people begin to think of morality in abstract terms, such as Americans believing that everyone has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At this stage, people also recognize that legality and morality do not always match up evenly. Kohlberg 1981. When hundreds of thousands of Egyptians turned out in 2011 to protest government corruption, they were using post-conventional morality. They understood that although their government was legal, it was not morally correct. Gilligan's theory of moral development and gender. Another sociologist, Carol Gilligan, 1936, recognized that Kohlberg's theory might show gender bias since his research was only conducted on male subjects. Would female study subjects have responded differently? Would a female social scientist notice different patterns when analyzing the research? To answer the first question, she set out to study differences between how boys and girls developed morality. Gilligan's research suggested that boys and girls do have different understandings of morality. Boys appeared to have a justice perspective, by placing emphasis on rules and laws. Girls, on the other hand, seem to have a care and responsibility perspective. They consider people's reasons behind behavior that seems morally wrong. While Gilligan is correct that Kohlberg's research should have included both male and female subjects, her study has been scientifically discredited due to its small sample size. 
The results Gilligan noted in this study also have not been replicated by subsequent researchers. The differences Gilligan observed were not an issue of the development of morality, but an issue of socialization. Differences in behavior between males and females is the result of gender socialization that teaches boys and girls societal norms and behaviors expected of them based on their sex. See, what a pretty little lady. Gilligan also recognized that Kohlberg's theory rested on the assumption that the justice perspective was the right, or better, perspective. Gilligan, in contrast, theorized that neither perspective was better. The two norms of justice served different purposes. Ultimately, she explained that boys are socialized for a work environment where rules make operations run smoothly, while girls are socialized for a home environment where flexibility allows for harmony in caretaking and nurturing. Gilligan 1982. Gilligan 1990. Sociology in the real world. What a pretty little lady. What a cute dress. I like the ribbons in your hair. Wow. You look so pretty today. According to Lisa Bloom, author of Think. Straight talk for women to stay smart in a dumbed down world. Most of us use pleasantries like these when we first meet little girls. So what, you might ask. Bloom asserts that we are too focused on the appearance of young girls, and as a result, our society is socializing them to believe that how they look is of vital importance. And Bloom may be on to something. How often do you tell a little boy how attractive his outfit is, how nice looking his shoes are, or how handsome he looks today? To support her assertions, Bloom cites, as one example, that about 50% of girls ages 3 to 6 worry about being fat, Bloom 2011. We're talking about kindergartners who are concerned about their body image. Sociologists are acutely interested in this type of gender socialization, by which societal expectations of how boys and girls should be, how they should behave, what toys and colors they should like, and how important their attire is, are reinforced. One solution to this type of gender socialization is being experimented with at the Agalia Preschool in Sweden, where children develop in a genderless environment. All the children at Agalia are referred to with neutral terms like, friend, instead of, he, or, she. Play areas and toys are consciously set up to eliminate any reinforcement of gender expectations, Haney 2011. Agalia strives to eliminate all societal gender norms from these children's preschool world. Extreme? Perhaps. So what is the middle ground? Bloom suggests that we start with simple steps. When introduced to a young girl, ask about her favorite book or what she likes. In short, engage with her mind, not her outward appearance. Bloom 2011